Hello everyone, I'm Kenshin. Welcome to History Talk. Speaking of the most discussed movies of 2023, it's certain that Oppenheimer has a place. However, the film only mentions his contribution to the development of the atomic bomb. But who knows, for such a scientist, after the 1954 hearings, the position of the US government plummeted instantly, even in terms of influence on atomic energy and national security issues. That's the role of Louis Strauss, who appeared in the movie. Today, let's get to know the key figure who shaped the atomic age and contributed to Oppenheimer's downfall, Louis Strauss. Before the program starts, please subscribe, like, and turn on the notification bell. Feel free to leave your feedback, which helps keep this program going. Thank you. Without further ado, let's begin. Louis Strauss was born in 1896. In his childhood, while waiting for a dentist to treat his teeth, he used a vibrating tuning fork to create waves in a bowl of mercury, sparking his interest in physics for the first time. Despite dreaming of studying physics in college, he succumbed to the reality of inheriting his father's struggling shoe business after graduating. He traveled as a salesman, carrying boxes full of shoe samples across the southeast, until he volunteered to help lead the First World War relief effort under Herbert Hoover. Strauss recalled, clearly, in Belgium and northern France, participating in history meant helping the hungry eat and dressing the naked. His impression on Hoover was so profound that he became the future president's private secretary, then joined an investment banking firm in New York in 1919, eventually earning an annual income exceeding $1 million. After both of his parents died of cancer, he established a fund to sponsor the use of radium as a therapeutic measure. This charitable work deepened his relationship with physicists dedicated to discovering nuclear fission. During World War II, after serving in administrative roles in the U.S. Navy, he became a leading figure in America's Cold War nuclear program. In 1946, President Harry S. Truman appointed him as one of the first five commissioners of the newly established Atomic Energy Commission AEC. Within days of the explosion of the Manhattan Project's top-secret wartime development in August 1949, the committee successfully detected the Soviet Union's first atomic bomb test. As the United States was no longer the world's sole nuclear superpower, he shifted to strongly support a large-scale project, the development of thermonuclear super bombs, with a power a thousand times greater than the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He wrote, now is the time for our plan to take a huge leap forward. If necessary, I am considering investments in talent and funds equivalent to those made in producing the first atomic weapon. This is the way to stay ahead. However, his support for the hydrogen bomb faced staunch opposition from physicist J. Robert Oppenheimer, then chairman of the AEC General Advisory Committee, leading the Manhattan Project in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Concerned that the hydrogen bomb would only accelerate the dangerous arms race of the Cold War, Oppenheimer advocated for greater openness in the scale and capabilities of the U.S. nuclear arsenal. But Strauss believed this would only benefit the Soviet Union. Nevertheless, he successfully persuaded President Truman to publicly announce the decision to develop the hydrogen bomb on January 31, 1950. Less than three years later, the United States detonated the world's first hydrogen bomb, with the Soviet Union following suit ten months later. In 1950, he left the AEC and returned to government service. In February 1953, newly elected President Dwight D. Eisenhower appointed him as an atomic energy advisor. Due to his significant contributions as a major donor to Eisenhower's presidential campaign, he wielded considerable power among all federal members. Agencies were tasked with purging activities related to atomic energy. Several months later, Eisenhower invited Strauss to serve as the chairman of the AEC. Strauss agreed but with one condition. Oppenheimer would no longer serve as an advisor to the committee. For the export of radioactive isotopes for medical purposes, this made him furious. There was a hatred expression on a man's face that you rarely see, recalled AEC chairman David Lilienthal. So, within days of being sworn in as AEC chairman, he ordered the removal of confidential documents from Oppenheimer's office, 
determined to prove that the father of the atomic bomb was no longer a national hero but a threat to national security. During the hysteria of the Second Red Scare, he and Senator Joseph McCarthy exposed hearings in the federal government, publicly questioning Oppenheimer's patriotism. Despite never formally joining the Communist Party, Oppenheimer had been attracted to left-wing political causes, and close friends and family had been Communist Party members at different times. Strauss believed the physicist might oppose the hydrogen bomb and conceal attempts by the Soviet Union to infiltrate the Manhattan Project, as he was a foreign agent. Strauss leveraged media relationships to publish defamatory stories about Oppenheimer, then urged FBI Director Edgar Hoover to monitor the physicist, with the FBI illegally wiretapping his phone. After winning Eisenhower's trust, Strauss doubted Oppenheimer's trustworthiness. Strauss's close friend wrote a letter to the president, claiming, Robert Oppenheimer is likely a Soviet agent. In December 1953, he informed Oppenheimer that his security clearance had been revoked. The physicist then decided to appeal to a three-person panel, which held a one-month hearing in April 1954. In a one-sided proceeding, Oppenheimer's lawyer was denied access to classified materials, and the panel, in a 2-1 vote, revoked his security clearance. This decision damaged Oppenheimer's reputation. He was a man of peace, but they ruined him. He was a scientist, but they ruined the man, lamented Oppenheimer's friend and physicist Isidore Isaac Rabi. Five years later, Oppenheimer paid the price by being blacklisted. When Eisenhower appointed Strauss as Secretary of Commerce, the Senate, after a painful confirmation hearing, refused to confirm the nomination. Strauss's treatment of Oppenheimer played a crucial role in the hearing, making him the eighth unsuccessful cabinet nominee in U.S. history and the only one between 1925 and 1989. After his failure, he focused on charitable activities until his death in 1974. This true story tells us that distorting and falsely accusing others for selfish gain may temporarily achieve your goals, but later, you'll pay a higher price. Your reputation and life may take a different path. What do you think?